Hi, welcome. My name is Aaron Cargo. I'm a professor of communication studies at The Beach, California State University, Long Beach. And this is a lecture on the value dimensions of culture. It's uh, part of my intercultural communication studies course here at CSULB. Uh, and it's also part of an intercultural communication reader that's available on my website that's pictured here on the slide. There's my contact information. Just Google my name and you'll get the website address. Um, you may be coming across this video on YouTube. Um, so just know that it's part of the larger reader that's available. It's useful on its own too, as you will. All right, so let me get started talking about the value dimensions of culture, in particular the international value dimensions. There's lots of ways of talking about culture um, culture isn't simply a nation state and it's simply not comprised of one value or the other individualism or collectivism um, contrary to uh, Hofstede who uh, has authored this book and which most of this lecture draws from I have a different philosophical epistemological context in which I understand culture and if you um, are interested you can go to the reader under the heading of culture and there's a reading there about the push me pull you uh, and that kind of gives you my philosophical epistemological context and nevertheless these dimensions have been foundational for the last 50 years and they're really important to understand and are useful regardless of you know the epistemological context that you find yourself using so all that aside let's get started looking at the value dimensions of international cultures You can see here, individualism, collectivism is our first dimension. And as I write, the most important dimension, probably even if you haven't taken an intercultural communication studies course or an anthropology course, you've heard of this dimension before. It's the one that's most widely known. Uh, it's the one that's the most researched. And I say it's the one that's the most important because it's um, the biggest divide, if you will. Um, values, not to elaborate a definition, but very simply, values are things that a society believes to be right or appropriate. And so we're looking at different values that are emphasized in one culture compared to another culture. So uh, if you want to understand the biggest difference in terms of what cultures think are right or appropriate, it's this one. It's the, I like to describe it as the, the continent view of culture. Certainly it's, you know, it's useful to look at, you know, uh, sub-Saharan Africa is different from North Africa, certainly. You know, there are differences within individualism uh, and a culture is more than the individualism collectivism dimension. Yet nevertheless, if we only have one opportunity to study a culture, how it's similar or different to other cultures, this is the place to start. Individualism, you can see here, I've got a definition for you. Quite simply, it's putting me first. Individualism is the value that says, if you have to choose between what you want to do and what others want you to do, you do what you want to do. Pretty simple. Collectivism, on the other hand, and you can see here, I have a definition for you, but quite simply, <laughs> it's that same dilemma. Um, and the answer to the question is what do you do when you want to do something and other people want you to do something else? In collectivist societies, the emphasis, the norm, the pattern is on doing what other people want you to do. That's what's important in a collectivistic context. <clears throat> I like to think of individualism, individualism, collectivism, dealing with the fundamental human struggle with recognizing that we are both independent, we you know, under normal circumstances, um, are born physically independent. You know, I can move where my parents, you know, I can move around in ways that don't obligate my parents or my siblings to move around, like we're not physically connected. Um, so there's this sense of independence born of our embodied presence. Yet at the same time, there's a sense of connection. You know, I, I wouldn't be who I am except for my family, except for my parents, except for my community. And so how do you deal with this tension between belonging and being a part of 
and being distinct and separate and different. And that's individuals and collectivism addresses this at its heart. Uh, here are some descriptions of the differences between individuals and collectivism. You can see the reference there at the bottom, uh, the book that will be referred to throughout this whole lecture. And um, you know, when I, I, I'm not concerned um, if you're you know, taking my course and, and watching this lecture, I'm not concerned so much that you understand every exact description here. I'm concerned that you understand the main idea. And if you understand the main idea, you know, self, other, which do you choose? Um, you know, who, who gets to decide what you do? Uh, then you can see how this is manifest in all these particular ways. So if you, if you think the self is more important uh, and that you get to do what you want to do, then of course individualism we see there the first characteristic that the use of I is encouraged. Of course, you're going to think in terms of I. In a collectivistic context, you're going to think in terms of we, less so in terms of I. Um, some things that are less evident, but nevertheless consistent, we see there the fourth characteristic, showing sadness is encouraged and happiness discouraged in a collectivistic context. How does that make sense? Well, the idea is that in a collectivist setting, the emphasis is on the group, and you don't want to disrupt the harmony of the group. So if you know you've just received wonderful news, you won the lottery. Well, you know <laughs> that's not not necessarily going to make other people feel good about themselves. So that's why the sowing happiness is discouraged. Whereas an individualist setting, it's all about me, baby. Like I don't care. <laughs> I don't even think about. Not that I don't care, but I don't even think about what other people might feel based on what I'm saying. So I won the lottery. Yeah, I mean, I won the lottery. You know, here's my ticket. Check it out. You know, happiness and the showing of happiness is encouraged. Um, some other characteristics in an educational setting. Of course, students are going to speak up in an individualistic context. Um, typically, in a collectivistic context, you kind of do group work. And, you know, if the group um, obligates or expects you to participate, then you will, but you don't sort of show off. Um, you don't engage the teacher individually as you might uh, otherwise. Another distinction, you can see the third characteristic. What's the use of an education, a diploma? In an individualist setting, the, the education furthers your own skill set so that you can you know, be a hired gun, take your skills and attributes and go wherever the work is. Whereas a diploma in a collectivist setting is for you to gain access to a group. And that, you know, once you gain access, then you're part of that group. You know, you, you get to, you know, work as, you know, part of this team. You're not necessarily going to take your skills and attributes and go elsewhere with them. So it's for entry versus economic worth and self-respect. Okay, so we get the main idea of individuals and collectivism, and we can see some specific characteristics um, proposed by Hofstad. Uh, what I want to talk about now are descriptions of individualism and collectivism that uh, have been really resonant for me and for my students over the last nearly 20 years that I've been teaching this course. Uh, these are descriptions that have helped folks over the years really get individualism and collectivism. We'll begin with the, with the former. So these come to us from the book Habits of the Heart uh, by Bella et al., a sociological classic looking at the United States culture, and these are ways in which individualism is manifest in this culture. The first one is a language of individual rights. Um, in U.S. political discourse, for example, you have a right to. It's my right my right to own a gun. You know, that's very powerful rhetoric. Um, you know, it's my body. You know, so I get to decide what happens to my body. Powerful rhetoric in the context of you know abortion politics. So we can see how appeals to the individual's rights is widespread, and that's a reflection of individualism. Because what's on the flip side? You know, it's the community's right. Now, so you might have a right to privacy, but the community has a right to know. Now, do they really? 
In, in U.S. context, most often that doesn't even enter into the conversation. You know, this is my right to privacy. Forget about it. You know, <laughs> no one else has a right to it. Yet there are some exceptions. There, there is some nascent, very beginning, you know, very um, mild and, and tepid, yet nevertheless existing rhetoric discourse around communal rights. Not very much. It's not very predominant. That's why we're not a collectivist society or collectivism isn't predominant in the United States. But as I argue, not to get too sidetracked by that epistemological discussion I avoided earlier, but I believe that every society has both value dimensions operating within it, this tension. And um, it's not a matter of the U.S. being only individualist. I think it's a matter of the U.S. being predominantly individualist. And in some small ways, collectivist. And so in one small way that we're collectivist in the United States is, is the weak and sporadic use of a communal right. And when I ask my students, you know, what, what the community has a right to, to know, what? Just, they, can't, they can't understand why the community would ever have a right to know. But then I say, suggest, you know, Megan's Law. Oh, okay. Megan's Law, if you're not familiar, is the right of the community to know where sexual predators, convicted sexual felons live, you know. Community has a right to know, we've decided, in the state of California. Um, we need to know where you live. Um, in fact, you can probably look up maps and find out where all the convicted sex felons live in your community because the community has a right to know, and that's one of the counterexamples of um, uh, collectivism in the U.S., but mostly it's about individual rights. Our second description there of individualism, self-reliance. This is the notion that coming from frontier days where white Atlantic America pushed west under the banner of Manifest Destiny, when you lived on the frontier, you um, took care of everything on your own because you had to because you were the only one around. Well, that mythic notion of a frontier still exists in our culture. You see it in films, for example. The hero of almost every action film does the job by himself, typically him. Um, you know, if you want something done right, do it yourself. So we see the Bourne character, Jason Bourne of the Bourne Identity. You know, he takes on all kinds of international organizations by himself. He right? takes on the CIA by himself. We see, you know, Rambo taking on the Soviet Army in the initial movie of that franchise, taking it on army on by himself. And you know, we see Bruce Willis and Die Hard taking on the cops by himself. You do it by yourself. It's a very resonant theme in U.S. culture. A third characteristic there, finding oneself, is also descriptive or evidence of individualism. To find yourself, um, I often ask my students, what, is it, what does that mean? You know, go find yourself. It's hard to, it's hard to put your finger on it, but we often come to a common understanding that finding yourself means somehow going away you know travel particularly go travel separate yourself from your community and there you know up on the mountaintop by yourself you'll have a chance to discover who you are that's a notion of how you find yourself in american culture and it's explicitly individualist you know you find yourself when you're alone we can imagine there's another way to find yourself that's collectivist. That, you know, you find yourself where you are in community. You find yourself as a brother, a sister, a teacher, a friend. You know, that's who you are. You don't leave the community to find yourself. You are a part of the community. Well, that's collectivism. In individualism, you take off by yourself to find yourself. A fourth characteristic we see there, defining oneself through work, is another feature of individualism. Many Americans, when they first meet one another at a party, for example, hey, what's your name, you know, uh, maybe where you go to school, if you're of a certain age or demographic, and then invariably the second or third question to be asked, if not the fourth, is, you know, so what do you do? It's this belief that somehow what you do counts for defining who you are. So whether you're a waiter or an actor, that's a big difference, right? If you're a lawyer or a plumber, that's a big difference, apparently, ostensibly, in U.S. culture. And that's a reflection of individualism. Collectivist cultures care less 
um, about what you do. This is something you do. Our fifth character characteristic down there, lifestyle enclave. I have a definition of it there for you because lifestyle enclaves look like collectivism on the surface. They're a group of people in community, yet it's not collectivism. It's a different kind of group. Um, traditional groups in a collectivist setting, you know, you can think of collectivism having sprung out of community and agricultural development. And so the small town uh, where people are bound together, they have to have a communal farm. Uh, if you go, you know, really far back before a farmer could do it independently, you, the community depended upon one another for, you know, their sustenance. And that community was comprised of all kinds of different members, different ages, different genders, different occupations. Um, that's a traditional group in a collectivist sense. A lifestyle enclave is an individualist group because it's a group, but it's a group that isn't born of necessity. It is a group that isn't born, um, you know, into being. It's a group that's created. It's a group that's crafted. It's a group that's self-selected. So a lifestyle enclave is a group that you get to choose. Hey, I want to be with other people that share my interests. And so you choose the other people who you're with. And so what makes this group individualist or reflections of individualism is the choosing, the individual choice. I'm not stuck with my family, as you would be in collectivism, <laughs> the group you're born into. I can choose to be with these other people, right? So a group of like-minded others. As an example, a retirement community here. Like, you know, you don't have to retire and be a burden on your kids and hang out with your, you know, your extended family. You, when you retire, you can retire with people who are like you. Wear the same damn yellow shirts that you wear, you know. <laughs> you can do whatever. So a, a, a retirement community is a lifestyle enclave. A gated community is a lifestyle enclave. You know, people of a certain socioeconomic background choose to live together. Um, so it's a group, but it's an individualistic group. And then lastly, leaving home is very much a reflection of individualism, kind of related to finding oneself. The notion that, you know, you get to a certain age and, the, you know, the bird's got to leave the nest. Well, they don't have to, right? We have all kinds of uh, patterns and configurations for relating when you look at the human species. Um, we think the narrative is so so powerful and you know, we think that we have to right and something's wrong if you don't leave home and go start your own family you know people who are still living with their parents when they're 30 or 40 or 50 are somehow you know wrong right that's what a value does it tells you what's right or wrong appropriate or inappropriate so a 40 year old man living with his you know mother and father and brother that's inappropriate we would often judge well collectivism as we'll see looks at the issue quite differently. You typically stay home longer, not that you don't leave home, but you typically stay home longer and the obligations are much more apparent to outsiders. So it wouldn't be so strange. It would be appropriate in many circumstances for a 40-year-old man to live with his mother, father, and brother as an example. So these are ways in which U.S. culture has decided what's right and what's appropriate in many instances. Um, but you know, getting back to that notion of attention, um, cultures aren't static. And there's a tension felt. The more, oftentimes, the more you push toward one value dimension, um, the more that creates impact and choices that favor, end up favoring another value dimension. So I'd like to uh, have you listen to a short uh, talk by Robert Putnam a uh, sociologist at Harvard, author of the book Bowling Alone, he talks about within the U.S. culture, so the same culture we've been talking about, it's not always simply a matter of me, 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 I, I, I. Um, we do have communities, yet the, the role and function of those communities have been changing in the last 50 years. Cultures are never static. They're always changing, moving, being affected by social trends and economic circumstances. So have a listen to how American culture has changed with regard to individualism and collectivism. In 1975, the average American went on five picnics. And the last year, the average American went on two picnics. So there's been a 60% decline in picnics in America. America is facing a little 
little recognized national picnic crisis. Don't get the wrong idea. Putnam's not some coleslaw crazed fiend. He's a professor of public policy at Harvard, and he's been studying the social trends of the last century. From 1900 to, roughly speaking, 1965, 1970, every year more and more people were involved in the Scouts and the PTA and the Moose Club. And then, suddenly, silently, mysteriously, sometime in the late 60s or early 1970s, all of those trend lines reversed and began to go downhill. He says we stopped joining things. We don't go to church as often. We're less likely to eat dinner with our own families. Crime rates increase and voter turnout plummets. And we trusted one another less, too. During that same period, levels of trust of other people began to decline. Now, we're not just talking about an empty Elks Lodge here. Picture the neighborhood bar of where everyone knows your name kind of place. Just plain hanging out at bars, drinking beer, is down by 35%. Where did everybody go? to work. And it's not just more women in offices since the 60s. Putnam says we're all spending more time commuting. But there's another culprit, TV. Most Americans watch, uh, you know, friends rather than having friends. What if you like watching friends? What if you'd really rather watch Cheers than hang out at an actual bar? Does it really matter? Your chances of dying over the next 12 months are cut in half by joining one group. Social isolation is as big a risk factor for death as smoking. So if you smoke and belong to no groups, it's a close call as to which is the riskier behavior. How can this be? Well, Putnam says it has to do with social support, having a ride to the doctor's office and so on. But it also turns out that being alone is physically very stressful. Being alone has a price, biochemically. So this is interesting to think about some of the consequences as our nation state has become more individualist. So that's the direction, not only in this country, as we'll see in other countries. Um, individualism is asserting itself because, as we'll see in a minute, individualism is connected with social wealth. Um, and so individualism asserts itself. There's, you know, being a third cultural person, as it were, uh, somebody who's studying culture and being biracial, bicultural individual personally. Um, you know, I don't often take sides. Of course, you have to take sides at, at some level. But um, I like to talk about the advantages and disadvantages of any given cultural pattern. Um, so not that individualism is a good or bad thing or collectivism a good or bad thing, but they have certain consequences. And as Putnam points out here, you know, individualism, the consequence is that we're not, we're not biologically, physiologically, um, evolve to be by ourselves. Yet um, we find ourselves increasingly because of technology, the capacity of technology uh, and wealth, we find ourselves by ourselves. And that's a bigger risk factor than um, we might think otherwise. So it's food for thought to see how uh, U.S. national culture has changed in the last 50 years and then some of the consequences of individualism. Okay, so based on that description of individualism, which, con which nations do you think have the highest individualistic cultures? This is uh, based on uh, Hofstede's book that I showed there at the beginning, um, 2010. It's an amalgamation of a number of different studies um, beginning in 1967, um, well, value surveys over the years. So there, you'll see as we present these lists, there's different numbers. There's 73, sometimes 96. It's, if you want the details, you can read the book. This is our most up-to-date um, understanding of the nationalistic value orientations of, in this case, I believe, 76 countries. And as I've talked about, you might think uh, America, the United States, as being individualist. Yes, it's number one. We're number one, baby. Most individualistic uh, culture, national culture in the world. As you look at this list of the top 15, the pattern that stands out, and the pattern, for those of you that are taking COM 330 and are going to be tested on this stuff, the pattern that I want you to recognize is that individualism, um, almost all those countries, or all European or Anglo, you can see there the list there, Americas or Latin countries, um, Europe, South, Southeast, sort of Mediterranean countries, Anglo or um, Anglo, and then also their cultural inheritors. So the United States is having... You know, fought independence from Great Britain is an Anglo culture. Australia is an Anglo culture, even though it's a world away. 
uh, ex-Soviet cultures, Middle East, and we'll see there actually it's a sort of catch-all. It's the Mideast and, and Mediterranean and North, all of Africa really kind of fits in that pile, uh, column. Not a lot of data from those countries, so the few that we have go there. And then Asia, and you see, don't, you don't see any, any other cultures, countries here except European or, or inheritors of European cultures. That's where individualism comes from. That's a striking pattern, and we'll talk about the origins in, in a minute. Uh, the other striking thing here, these are the lowest in individualism. So Hofstede doesn't purport to measure collectivism, just cultures that don't have a lot of individualism. So we might think of them as collectivist cultures. Um, and we see the trend here between Asian and Latin. Um, most of the cu cultures um, on the bottom half, those that are highly collectivist or low individualist. And that's a pattern that you should recognize. We talk about East Asian collectivism and, and Latin American collectivism. I'll talk more about East Asian a uh, collectivism because that's something I know a little bit more about. If we want to look at this in terms of you know the map, we can see uh, basically individualism is the legacy of colonialism. As colonialism spread European cultures around the world, it spread individualism. Uh, individualism is connected with uh, wealth is, is the main thing. Uh, as you can see from the book here, uh, the strong relationship between national wealth and individuals is undeniable with the arrow of causality directed from wealth to individualism. Basically, um, human beings evolve, societies evolved in a collectivist context, you depended upon one another. You know, you, you couldn't sustain agriculture by yourself. But as technology and wealth increased, you could do these things by yourself. Think about the individual farmer in Nebraska and all the things that he typically can do by himself thanks to technology. You don't have to depend on the community. You know, you got a big combine to do this stuff. Uh, and then wealth. Wealth, um, makes these relationships disposable. Whereas, you know, if you don't have wealth, you depend on other people to do things for you and with you. If you do have wealth, you just pay other people. So it's not that individualists aren't brought into contact and don't depend upon other people um, or don't need other people, but, but the monetization of that relationship makes it an issue of choice. I get to choose who I'm going to pay you know, to harvest my fruit or to clean my house or to fix my car. Um, and so with that wealth comes a sense of independence, a value emphasis on independence, even though, you know, the little secret is we still need each other. Even if you're the wealthiest person on earth and have the most technology, you still depend upon other people to develop that technology, um, to implement that technology, um, to help you with your standard of living. But you have that agency, that choice um, with that wealth. So that connection goes very deep. And so we saw in the American example, the U.S. example, how we become a more individualistic culture. And we're seeing in China, for example, right now, you know, that's creating a lot more individualist emphasis within the culture as we see the introduction of, of great wealth. So that's the main um, factor. Now, as I mentioned earlier, uh, I, I'm more familiar with East Asian collectivism, and one of the ways of explaining East Asian collectivism, outside of wealth, you know, these countries, as we'll see, um, many of these countries were underdeveloped or being developed in the last 50 or 60 years ago, certainly relative to, uh, you know, Western colonial powers. Um, so that explains to some extent uh, why they're collectivism. But the main explaining um, event is, is history and Confucianism. Um, Confucianism is a philosophy that was widely spread, you can see by this map, throughout East Asia, uh, certainly Vietnam, China, Korea, to some extent, Japan. Um, and Confucianism, the, the values of Confucianism coincide uh, with collectivism, or you might say collectivism was born of Confucianism in this context. So some basic Confucian concepts that I think uh, help explain the notion of collectivism. So if you understand these concepts, you'll understand the notion of collectivism a bit better. So our first concept is gen, gen, warm human feelings. 
achieved most often through practices of reciprocity. So the idea, as Confucius said, is you want to be a part of society, get connected to society, and the way that you do that is, um, you know, you exchange, you reciprocate, you know, you give gifts, and the other person gives you gifts, you provide time and services, they provide time and services, and that generates Zhen, this warm human feeling or connection. And that's the glue of society. And we can see that's collectivism, right? You're, you're, Jen puts an obligation on you to feel good about being with another person. And that obligation is a, a manifestation of collectivism. Shu, knowing how others feel or empathy, is also derived from Confucian principles and coincides with collectivism or helps us understand how collectivism operates. Won't be talking about it here, but uh, in the course, we talk about high context communication, and you might check out the Intercultural Reader for some related information. But high context communication is um, practiced in collectivist societies, and it's a manner of communicating that demand you know what other people are experiencing. You can't communicate in a high context manner without knowing what people are going through and where they're at. So, Shu is developing your intuition. And how do you develop intuition except by spending a lot of time with people? and developing that shared experience. And through that shared experience and shared time comes an intuition that is a manifestation of collectivism. And then E, the opposite of individual interest and profit, selfless striving for the common good. Um, I like to talk about E here, I'll show you on this next slide, um, is, the, is the antagonist to capitalism. In capitalism, the notion is, is that you enrich yourself and as you enrich yourself, the community is benefited. So you hear in political discourse, you know, trickle down economics. What does that mean? You know, the rich get richer and that their wealth will help the community. You hear, you know, in political discourse, you, know, you can't raise taxes on the wealthiest Americans because they're the job creators. So the notion that individual wealth is connected to communal wealth by making individual wealth primary and communal wealth comes about after. E is, takes that notion, takes that formula, and flips it. E says, you strive to enrich the community, and you personally will be benefited as a consequence. And so I have here a picture of the Bangladeshi economist, economist uh, who uh, won a, a well-known prize uh, talking about microcredit. And the notion was he wanted to help his community and, you know, we can't, these institutions, these large banking institutions aren't making the loans that help the community. So let's, let's come up with a system of, of, of economic relationships that help the community. And you could argue that he benefited from E. He was concerned with helping the community and then as an after effect, he was personally enriched, became famous and won this one and a half billion dollar prize. So he literally became rich as a consequence of having his interests um, be aligned with the community. So E is, um, you know, selfless striving for the common good, and you can get rich and benefit from that. But that's secondary. So capitalism, which is connected with individualism, has the opposite formulation of E, which is connected with collectivism. And again, my sort of epistemological context, um, uh, I haven't described here, but I keep referring to it, is that these tensions sometimes come into balance and, and call it synthesis, temporary balance point, where you meet both of your needs and obligations, your need and obligation to the community and your need and obligation to yourself. And so red is a is creative capitalism, an example of creative capitalism in which uh, has recently arisen there. You see Bono and, and, and Bill Gates and I think that's the guy from Dell Computers or something. They launched this whole product line. It's sort of like the... You know, you buy this product, it's a good product, but it'll also benefit the community. You know, creative capitalism, thinking about the needs of the community while also thinking about your own individual interests. A synthesis, you know, put these in balance, connect them up. So E, Jen, and Shu are all Confucian concepts that illustrate um, how you think about things uh, in many collectivist situations. Another illustration of collectivism that I'd like to share with you that helps us appreciate the sort of orientation of collectivism and what it means to be collectivist 
for many of us who have little or no experience with collectivism. Um, I'm uh, drawing from some research I did, uh, cited reference there at the bottom. Uh, these are uh, Japanese natives' descriptions of friendship terminology, the stories that they told when presented with these terms. And I'm going to highlight three of them here because I think they illustrate, particularly when contrasted with American styles of friendship, they illustrate um, a, a particularly Japanese and moreover an East Asian collectivist view on how to relate to other people. So the first term is nakama, which means friendship group. It means friendship and group at the same time, which already is different from a U.S. context because friend usually means an individual. I'm friends with somebody. It doesn't imply or infer a whole group. And so I often ask my students, you know, what, do we have a term that means friendship and group at the same time? And certainly we have some, but they're not very mainstream and they might have some negative connotations, negative connotation, such as, you know, my, my gang, you know, my homies, um, homies, suggest, you know, group. Uh, friendship, to some extent, um, has other connotations there, but we don't really have an equivalent term of nakama. So as this uh, respondent said, nakama are the people who you do things together and you feel relaxed enough. It's a group. A good example would be people who belong to the same club activity as you. So nakama is, emphasizes collectivism or illustrates collectivism because friendship is done in groups, and groups are collectivistic. Shinyu is a second term that I think illustrates collectivism because, it, because of the sense of obligation that it connotes. Shinyu is the term in Japanese that means best friends, and I put best in quotes as a translation because when most U.S. Americans think about best friends, what I suggest by the quotes is it's not really equivalent. Uh, yes, it, it, it approaches our notion and expectation of best friends approaches Shinyu, but it's not Shinyu because Shinyu goes above and beyond our U.S. notions. And because it goes above and beyond in the sense of obligation, it illustrates collectivism, where what the other person needs um, is more important than, than what you need. You're obligated to do what the group needs or what others need before what you need. So as one Japanese respondent um, described Shinyu, he said, in Chinese there's a term funkai, no, tomo, which is common in Japan, means if you're beheaded, then I could be the same. It means if you die for some great cause, you know, I can die with the same cause with you together. Very strong, right? It means we can die together. I don't think maybe we actually die, but that's the sense of strong emotional attachment. So uh, for him, that was the connotative meaning of the term, not that he would literally die for his friend, but that's the sense of emotional attachment. When someone's your shinyu, you do things for them. I had another respondent tell me, you know, she changed her career path for her best friend. And I'll ask my American students, does anybody, you know, you have a best friend, you know, what do you do for them? Oh, you know, I take care of them when they're sick or I call them or, you know, you do things up to a certain level of obligation, but you know, change my life for them? Pfft, forget about it. That's not, that's not what we do in an American friendship context because we're individualists. You know, ourself is, is first. But in the context of Xin Yu, this uh, uh, respondent said, yeah, you know, I was in a grad program and enrolled, but my friend was having a hard time back in our hometown, and I, you know, dropped out of the program and went back home and, in order to be with her. That's a sense of commitment that oftentimes is engendered in a collectivist setting. Lastly, the notion from Japanese that illustrates collectivism is tsukiai, and roughly translated as obligatory associating. I think this best illustrates the notion of collectivism because it, it meets you at the point where there's a tension between what you want to do and what other people want you to do. And in collectivism, you've got to do what other people want you to do, and that's sukiai. So as someone explained, you and I are colleagues in the same workplace. Now, I'm going to the bar to drink. Don't you want to go there? Sukiai means because we are colleagues or friends, you may have to go back home. Your wife is waiting, but since we are colleagues, just sukiai or be accompanied with me. So you have, like, I want to do this, but everybody else wants me to do that. I'm going to do that. So again, I'll ask my students, you know, you, this scenario. You know, you're at workplace, people are going out. You want to do something else. You had already planned something. What happens in that instance? And most students say, oh, well, so I'll take a rain check. You know, I, you know, I, I don't mind. I'd like to go out with you guys, but I already have plans. So your own plans take precedence. And that's the notion of individualism. 
Individual values take precedence. In collectivism, the group values take precedence. Now, it can go to an extreme, as this example illustrates. In uh, Vietnam, officials faulted for not singing karaoke. Um, so here you have an office party, and people are singing karaoke, and, and some officials didn't want to sing. They didn't sukiai, they didn't go along, right? And they were criticized for not going along. Um, it's hard to think in American context how, you know, the equivalent example, you know, you better join the group, and if you don't, we're going to, you know, punish you or, or criticize you for not joining the group. But in collectivism, that, that impulse and that behavior is certainly understandable. So as someone else explained about Tsukiai, uh, I think a lot of the relationship is just defined. You define if this relationship, if this person is inside your group or outside your group, once you decide that the person is in, you don't question the quality that the person has. You just kind of spend time with and get used to, try to get used to the person. It's kind of like being in a family, you know, tsukiai. Um, I'm not going to pick who I like or who's easy to be with, but circumstances and life has picked these individuals for me, and I'm just going to make a go of it. I'm obligated to these people. I'm connected to these people, uh, and that's what's important in a collectivist context. So that ends my lecture discussion of individual collectivism, and we'll turn to the next dimension of culture.